Welcome. Hi. Uh, my name is Brad Allen. I'm the director of Lawrence Public Library. I'm really, really excited about this program tonight. And I'm here to introduce Nabil Ayers, and then he's going to um, do a presentation and, and do a reading, and then we'll have a little conversation and some Q&A. So um, for folks who are trying to figure out the best way to describe Nabil Ayers, um, it's the son of Roy Ayers, um, and he also... Uh, so record, you know, record label executive played in rock bands, played in rock bands here at the bottleneck back in the day, um, has just had this career in music, um, just a very interesting, unique childhood growing up. And then, and, and a really great story in this memoir of finding family and defining what family is. Um, he is the, the U S president of the beggars group, um, here in the United States, which is some of our as a indie rock kid from the '90s, some of my favorite labels of 4AD and Matador, Rough Trade, and XL. So um, we're just going to have a conversation tonight about his book, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Nabil Ayers. Welcome. Right. And let's get let's I'll, let's get this video here. I'll, and now, if you just hit, thank you, play, it'll start. It'll okay. So I'm gonna. Hi, thanks for coming. I'm Nabil. Um, we're going to start with a little, it's sort of a film. Uh, basically, my assumption, this book is relatively new, is that a lot of people haven't read it. So I have this kind of short film that I'll talk over that's basically the cliff notes, and you can kind of find out not everything that happens in the book, but a lot of it. And then, uh, and then we'll talk some more. Let me find my notes. Can we dim the lights a little bit? Are they already dimmed? Oh, that's nice. That's good. We'll try that. Yeah. Space bar. I think that's fine. I can see it off the film. Yeah. Or, you know, we can get the spot for that. Yeah, that's spot me. We have sound. I don't hear the audio, but I'll start. Oh, wait, maybe it's not playing. Now it's playing. Yeah, no audio, but I'll talk over it anyway. When she was 21, my mother knew she wanted to be a young single mother, so she decided to have me with my father's consent, knowing that he wouldn't be part of our lives. My mother's younger brother, my uncle Alan, is a jazz saxophonist. I spent a lot of time with Alan as a kid, and he naturally was her figure. I spent a lot of my childhood at Allen's downtown New York City loft, where he paid $125 a month. Today, the neighborhood is called Tribeca. It's one of the most expensive neighborhoods in the world. When I was two and a half years old, Allen bought me a real drum set. He and I played together all the time and I learned to play drums by playing along with albums on my own. Is the audio available? If not, it's okay. <laughs> okay. I only met my father a few times as a child. In 1976, he released an album that connected with me more than he ever did in real life. When I was eight, Alan brought me to New York's legendary Electric Lady Studios, where Roy was recording. Jimi Hendrix and Stevie Wonder recorded albums there. But I only cared about one album. <laughs> I knew that Electric Lady was where Kiss recorded Destroyer, the first album I ever bought on my own. When I was seven, my mother took me to see Kiss at Madison Square Garden, a concert that changed my life. I didn't identify with the musicians that I loved. The Beatles had straight hair I knew I'd never grow and Stevie Wonder had an afro that was much tighter than mine, but there was nothing that stopped me from looking like Kiss. When I was 10, my mother and I moved from New York City to Salt Lake City. It was a huge culture shock. That's the Mormon temple in the background. For the first time in our lives, my mother was making money. I got a brand new drum set and I watched a lot of MTV. The next summer, when I visited New York, my uncle Alan and I were at Manny's Music on 48th Street. When we ran into someone Alan introduced as Roy, I didn't recognize him. 
It wasn't until we left that Alan explained we'd just run into my father. By the time I finished junior high school, my mother and I had evolved from New York City hippies to Salt Lake City preppies and citizens of corporate America. In high school, I straddled two worlds. I spent summers in New York City with Alan, seeing the bands that didn't play Salt Lake City. And I had my preppy life in Salt Lake, where I played drums in a band, worked as a dishwasher, and tried to fit in with all the blonde kids. That's me in the top right, in case you couldn't tell. <laughs> I went to college outside Seattle. I was a terrible student, but I loved playing music, interning at a record label, and going to shows. After college, I moved to Seattle and got a job at a record store, and I joined a tough guy rock band called The Lemons. We toured with Joan Jett and the Circle Jerks, and we also went to jail. In 1997, my friend Jason and I opened a record store in Seattle called Sonic Boom Records. Indie rock exploded, and we sold tons of CDs by Death Cab for Cutie, Modest Mouse, and Sleater Kinney. The store turns 25 this weekend, which is crazy. In the early 2000s, when the store started to take off, we had three locations, several, several celebrity customers, and we threw lots of parties. I joined a band called Alien Crime Syndicate, who opened for the Pixies and for Weezer, and we also did a tour of Six Flags amusement parks, opening for Sugar Ray. In 2005, I joined a band called The Long Winters, and while touring Europe for the first time, I bought a fancy shirt and grew a mustache. When I was 34, I finally reached out to my father. Over lunch, we had our first ever real conversation. I hoped we'd be able to have similar meetings in the future, but it never came to pass, and for the first time in my life, I felt angry with him. In 2008, I moved from Seattle back to New York City. Barack Obama got elected president. I'm supposed to cheer at that part. <laughs> And I started working at 4AD, the British record label I'd admired since high school. I met the love of my life, AJ, and when I started writing for fun, she encouraged me to write less about my bands and my record store and more about my father and my race. My life was great, but I was still frustrated with how little I knew about my father. So I did 23andMe. I always knew about my Russian and Romanian ancestors on my mother's side. But I never knew anything about my father's side until I discovered a family tree, which led back to one enslaved man, Isaac Ayers. Then I connected with Karen, a descendant of the people who owned my ancestors. Karen and I became close friends. I found my half-sister, Ebony, who was born the same year I was. Oh, there's the music. And I discovered new family in Los Angeles, including my aunt, who also has great taste in glasses. I still don't know my father, but writing this book helped me to feel gratitude for the many things in my life he's given me and for the family I've connected with. Thank you. Should we take it to the chairs? I need to press stop it. Just leave that there. Yeah, so apologies. We are supposed to give the Hello. These programs. <laughs> oh, we can hear the stream delay. <laughs> That's great. It's all right. Um, so should I read a small section from the book and then we can talk about it? Or do you want to talk first? Okay. 
chat. Sounds great. I'm going to read um, the very first section. I guess it's sort of an introduction. It's called Straight Out of Compton. And this goes back to this takes place in 2015. What is that happening? <laughs> I was in your phone. Just don't oh, think so. Okay, here we go. When I see a movie theater advertising straight out of Compton, I know how I'm about to spend the next two hours. What better setting, I think, to watch a blockbuster about the LA rap group NWA than this, the city from which it emerged? It's the summer of 2015, and I'm in Los Angeles at the FYF Music Festival where backstage I am repeatedly mistaken for a newly famous director who has made music videos for Kendrick Lamar, Kanye West, and Frank Ocean, and goes simply by his first name, Nabil. When I'm introduced to some people, it's telling to hear their voices suddenly become more hip-hop, attempting to drop a bit of street into their words, an affectation they adopt only when they think they're meeting the rap video director. Not that Nabil always elicits a humble apology. People aren't aware that even though he's made video for hugely famous black artists, Nabil is half white and half Iranian and looks much more white than I do. While I was hoping to spend today at the festival with the artists I work with, instead, I slowly walk around the newly revitalized downtown Los Angeles, recovering from a terrible case of food poisoning. The thought of seeing straight out of Compton in a comfortable air-conditioned theater is much more appealing than the sensory overload of a crowded music festival. I force down the rest of my banana, guzzle my remaining seltzer, and still feeling weak, buy a ticket to the matinee. Compton begins with a bang. In five fast minutes, the Los Angeles police destroy a drug house. Bullets and expletives fly, vicious dogs bark, and armored vehicles are smashed through residential smash through residential, re residential walls like they're made of paper. And I'm completely sucked in, happy to have my mind numbed by Hollywood action, even if the portrayal is devastatingly true to life. The bombastic opening scene ends and the ensuing silence is broken by a piano sound, followed by an unmistakably familiar lazy synthesizer melody. My pulse suddenly feels very present in my body. The song's patient, buoyant pace drives the camera's slow movement, which reveals a bedroom adorned with posters, records, DJ gear, and eventually a teenage boy lying down with his eyes closed and headphones wrapped around his head. The character, meant to be NWA founder and producer Dr. Dre, wears a Los Angeles Dodgers jersey and hat as he subconsciously airplays the piano, the congas, and the synthesizer along with the song. The overhead shot shows a record spinning with a legible red Polydor label at its center. The scene, which contains no dialogue, does everything to convey that Dre is lost in the music. The camera closes in on Dre, surrounded by album jackets, and I brace myself, knowing what I'm about to see. And there it is, one album standing apart with its white border, a man in a tight yellow t-shirt, a beard, and an afro stands against a bright yellow background. His hand rests confidently on his hip, and he smiles as he looks off camera, radiating casual conviction. I can't read the album title, but I don't need to. I already know the man on the cover. The music is so loud that I physically feel it in my chest and ass. The lyrics offer the first voices in the scene. My life, my life, my life, my life in the sunshine blasts from the modern theater speakers, and the chorus of male and female voices further shakes my weakened constitution. I am alone in a dark movie theater, 3,000 miles from home, feeling skinny and sick, and completely caught off guard by the most famous song by my father, Roy Ayers. Everybody Loves the Sunshine was a moderate hit when it was first released in 1976, but it's grown over time. It's been sampled more than 100 times by various artists, including Mary J. Blige, Common, J. Cole, Tupac, Snoop Dogg, and Black Eyed Peas. It's been covered by D'Angelo and Chibo Mato, spanning decades and constantly refreshing itself into modern context. I've heard it in many different iterations over the years, a perennial, persistent reminder of my otherwise absent father. After one very long minute of music, Dre's mother surprises him by turning off the record, which snaps him out of his med meditative state. My chest feels hot and my breath is short. My first reaction is to sink into my cushy chair and look around the theater to see whether anyone is looking at me. Is this what it would feel like to run into him? I wonder. 
I'd last seen my father nine years earlier when I was 34, but that had been planned, a lunch in Seattle, my first ever meeting with him as an adult. The time before that, when I was 11, I had no idea who he even was. Since moving back to New York City, where he lives, I'm always slightly subconsciously on guard, ready to run into him, but I definitely wasn't expecting it in a dark movie theater in Los Angeles while getting over food poisoning. Though my father and I live in the same city and are both in the music business, our paths have never crossed in the seven years that I've lived in New York. Occasionally, someone asks me how he's doing. It surprises me every time, and I usually respond with something like, you'd probably know better than I would, which feels confrontational and often leads me to offer a slightly apologetic, less biting explanation that he's never been a presence in my life. How, I wonder, did a hippie child in New York City who never knew his father become a grown man who still didn't know his father but encountered his music regularly? Were moments like these truly coincidental or had my father's DNA guided me into a life in music and ultimately to the places where his presence caught me off guard? It's been over a year since I last tried to contact my father and though I was unsuccessful, I decide it's time for another try. I know he won't be the father I'd never had but maybe he can be the father I meet for lunch once or twice a year, the father who tells me about his life and my family history, the father who texts me each year on my birthday. He might not respond, but even if my father ignores me, I will have tried. Little do I know in that moment that the impact of that minute in the theater, the intensity of hearing my father's music, my music in a public place through huge speakers and staring at his picture on a giant screen will be the catalyst that opens up two centuries of perspective on my family. A great prologue. Thank you. To, to, to tease everyone to read the rest of the book. Um, I would say again in the confusion, I, I should stop for a moment in the confusion of being uh, um, a bit rattled by the day. I forgot to thank our partners who are here um, in my introductions. I didn't have all my notes at the podium. So uh, I want to thank um, the, the Department of African and African American Studies, the Department of American Studies, and the School of Music for partnering on this. Uh, and, and I didn't mention that before, and I apologize. It's really good to see Professor Jelix and Professor Alexander and, and folks here. So thank you so much. Um, I just I felt like I got to, had to backtrack and say that. And the Raven is here to sell some books. So they've got so many, I think each of you need to buy one. Um, and so we're grateful for you to be here on a busy night for the Raven selling their 35th anniversary. So y'all are putting the work in. Um, so really, the I'm really glad that you're here because I me too. I, I fell in love with this book. A, a, a friend introduced it to me and, and suggested we try to do something here in Lawrence. So I'm grateful that you've made the trip out here um, to the Midwest and reading this book over the last month there are just so many great things i thought would people would enjoy hearing about and just and just kind of having a conversation about yeah. so for me i think it's like i was saying it's almost like a choose your own adventure right like i try to explain what this story is about and it's about your life which is multifaceted and so um you mentioned a, a bit at the very beginning kind of the the you know the premise that sets the book and and that you know the choice that your mother made to be a single mother and this and this life that you had um, growing up that was, um, I mean, if you could just kind of talk about that that life in New York City and Cambridge in the early to mid 70s, it's kind of a magical yeah. thing. Yeah, it was great. I mean, the, the quick backstory, which it probably got from the, the reading or the, the film, but my mother grew up in Long Island, sort of normal suburban kid in New York. Her father was a lawyer, but but would claim that she just didn't have a great childhood. And I think was living in New York at about, 20 years old and felt young and lost as she describes it didn't know what she wanted to do but knew she wanted to have a kid and wanted to be a single mother which is an interesting thing to know at 20 years old um and when she met my father at a jazz concert she was introduced to him and immediately said to herself this is the person i want to have my kid with and to be clear not this is the person i want to marry or this is the person i want to be with but this is the father of my child so they dated a few times over the course of a year and she eventually said I want to have a child with you. You don't have to be part of our lives. And he agreed. So I've always known that story. So it was never, he never left us. There wasn't a divorce. He was never supposed to be in the picture. Um, and 
So we moved around a lot. We lived in New York City and Amherst, Massachusetts and Cambridge and never had any money. My mother was on welfare and she eventually went back to school and, and my father's black and my mother is white. So on paper, it just sounds like the worst case scenario. It sounds like a kid is going to end up going to jail or something as an adult. But it was actually this really idyllic, amazing childhood, I think because my mother was just so good about surrounding us with great people, incredible male role models, tons of music. She's a dancer. My uncle, who's basically my father figure, is a jazz musician. So, And most importantly, we lived in like really great communities where I, as a poor biracial kid with no father, wasn't at all abnormal. It was really normal to be like me. And so I, for my first 10 years of my life, until we moved to Salt Lake City, uh, I was just a normal kid. And I think that was important to have as a base. Now, that, that's what I love about it is like, and I was, um, I, we had, when we were talking on the way down here, I mentioned that, that my first library job was at Los Angeles Public Library. And the person I met there was Baha'i. And like she was just and she was like the most positive, uplifting. Per I was like, this person is amazing. I and I was like, what? You can't drink, and it just ruined the whole thing for me. But <laughs> but the thing is, is like, which is probably a bad thing, is taking me down a bad course. But this, it, but the Baha'i create this beloved community that is this really beautiful part of just kind of a different way that you approach what a, what a good life is and what that means. It's just a really I thought a really great part of the book that that shows what do you really need to be happy and what and what can a childhood be like. Yeah, um, the, the Baha'i faith is so cool because I, I mean, I my mother and uncle were raised Jewish and didn't ever like reject that it was they weren't like people who hated the Jewish faith. They just were hippies in New York in the late sixties and early seventies and learned about the Baha'i faith and became really fascinated with it. So so much about peace and unity and equality and all these great things. And so Nabil is a Baha'i name, and they were very involved when I was born. And I remember as a kid going to tons of Baha'i events, and they, they didn't feel religious to me. We weren't like going to church, or I didn't have to like memorize things. I just remember, as you describe, incredibly positive, kind people, and like great food, and just really good vibes all the time. And then when we moved to Salt Lake City, there's there are some Baha'is there, but not, not a huge community, so it kind of went away. But it was definitely a big part of those first 10 years. Yeah. Right. And that, you know, and, and then that's a, another really, I think, interesting transition is going, you know, going from that, that, that type of lifestyle into going to a play and then, and because there's this, that kind of community and then, and then your mother's vision of really, you know, she gets her MBA at, at UMass and I I still can't. I, I love the part. There's a the Grateful Dead story. Like in the okay. like, I went and listened to the Grateful Dead show. That like oh, you can listen to that show. Yeah, right? like I listened to that show. I had to like at Amherst, but she, you, and you know, in, in Amherst, working on the degree and, uh, but so there's this striving too of like looking for this better life that she's interested in providing in it, and it was just the story of finance moving from New York to Salt Lake, where there's right. so much of that now in the '80s. It's just this really interesting move, and then talk, you know. I love the way you write in the book. You talk a little bit more about just kind of take, understanding how to adapt to that world, the, the things that you had to do to navigate this different space. Yeah, it was weird. So my mother, we moved to New York when I was nine. She got a job. At, she got her MBA in Amherst, got a job at American Express, and suddenly, you know, she was wearing like the business suit and doing all that, and uh, and hated it. She, you know, she she went to school and got a job like that so that we could have a better life, but she wasn't competitive. She didn't want to be in corporate America. That was just how we could have money or, you know, live. So I think especially in the financial district in New York in the early 80s, it was like really cutthroat. She absolutely hated it. I remember how unhappy she was. So American Express moved a big part of the company to Salt Lake that year and gave a lot of people the opportunity, like, if you'll go, we'll pay you the same amount in a city that is significantly less expensive than New York. And it's all about like such a family town. The hours are nine to five, truly. Like you would never, you won't work late, anything. And so she kind of jumped at it and we just moved there on a whim. And of course, I was worried about it for lots of reasons. I thought it was going to be a musical wasteland because I was already so into music and playing drums. And of course, my race too. I mean, it's so white. And it was the first place for sure where it wasn't like overt racism, but it was like, Kids wanted to touch my afro. Kids were asking me about my name or like giving me funny nicknames and you know just like all that kind of stuff that kids do. And it was weird to have never had any of that happen for ten years and to have it all start happening at once in this 
place with all these blonde kids. It was super weird. But at the same time, and I think maybe it was the sort of confidence that I built over those 10 years, I, we really liked it there. And I, we stayed for seven years. I graduated high school there and had a great time and played in bands and saw every band and actually had a really good childhood. Yeah, no, that was a twist I wasn't seeing. Salt Lake City was <laughs> yeah. not a twist I saw coming in the story. But because, and then that's really a formative part of your life. Is you know one other thing you know that is, you know, every chapter in the book is is you know is, is a song is an album or a song title or, um, and so music definitely threads through the entire book. Um, then you know, but that's you know, and so you'd been playing drums when you were younger, but really the formative age of playing in music and bands is as you were in in that space uh, you know th is there anything else to add kind of in that those year, teenage years of playing music and yeah. how you started to get into that in salt lake i mean i think i mean i really you know new york was obviously an incredible cultural and musical place and so i was like we're going to salt lake no bands are going to play there and like there's going to be nothing but it was the opposite i got a new drum set which was incredible i played drums every day way more than i did in new york because our neighbors didn't care and uh and so many bands played there, and maybe because it was between Denver and Seattle, or it's Denver like the only and LA. place to play on the way. <laughs> yeah, and because there's so many kids there, because the Mormons tend to have a lot of kids, so they're they're really like bands would play there, and I saw tons of bands and you know whatever Guns and Roses and Jane's Addiction, like really incredible shows and much smaller venues. It was easy to go. They were always all ages. They weren't expensive. It was kind of great for that. And then the big thing that changed for me the year we moved there was the year that MTV started. And we had cable. So that was suddenly like, so the weird thing is I moved to Salt Lake and my musical life just blew up. It was incredible. It's way better than it would have been in New York, I think. Yeah. So it's, I love that part of the story. Um, and so from there you go to Tacoma and to University of Puget Sound. And, and this, is, this is kind of, I guess, one thing that I really enjoyed about that book. And I thought other people, at least in might be interested in just kind of coming of age and kind of the ascendance of college radio into alternative radio and then right. to nirvana and kind of being there in the inception of that in the late eight in the late 80s into early 90s like yeah i know what what was that like like to, i don't know or you there's a great thing where you hear the I, that's in salt lake but a great story about when you hear the pixies for the first time yeah. like hearing bone machine like in a yeah, I was in my fr friend's car and he just put on the tape and I remember just being like so freaked out by it. Like, what is this? I think I like this. I think I'm scared by this. Like, I've just never heard anything this sort of raw and rough and weird, you know, now that's just like indie rock. But right. <laughs> at 15 or whatever in a station wagon in Salt Lake City, that just sounded like crazy, adventurous music. But um, But yeah, I went to college in Tacoma, which is just outside of Seattle in 1989. And there's no way I could have known that that was just like the perfect time to go there if I was into music and spent most of college like playing in bands, DJing at my college radio station, going to tons of shows, going to record stores, doing everything but studying. I really like scraped by enough that I could do all those other things, which now, of course, relate way more to my career than <laughs> any of my classes would have, except maybe the writing class. Um, and it was just so fun to, I mean, to drive to Seattle and like see Soundgarden and Nirvana and these bands in clubs and even like small theaters, but whatever. They were like big local bands. They weren't like nobodies that would have been earlier, but it was, right. and it was really fun to, to later be in the music business and I work with tons of bands. I get to do lots of things and that's all great. But in a way, the most fun part was just being a fan and not having that access and not knowing anyone and just like buying a ticket to a show and going. Was there, did you, I can still, I can remember um, being in Manhattan as I like when the advanced like single for Smells Like Teen Spirit came oh, out yeah. and the guys at the KDSB you know, radio session were like, ha, oh, like Nirvana is going to be a big deal. And they were just kind of laughing it off. Like, and then it became what it was. Did, I mean, did you, you know, being there and hearing that, I mean, do you, and being as so tapped into so many different musics you've been, did, was there any indication to you that there was something that, would you have expected to what had happened to had happened when you were right. there? Like maybe not, maybe not, not exactly what happened, but there was, this isn't in the book, but I wrote about it for Rolling Stone. I was at the show. I, my friends and I tried to go be extras in the movie singles 
because Alice in Chains was shooting a live scene and there was like an open call for extras to come be the audience. We couldn't get in. So instead, this is April of 91, six months before Nevermind. Instead, we went to see Nirvana, who was playing at the OK Hotel, which is like this 300 person club in Seattle on the waterfront. And and I we, we knew them. Like my, one of my roommates had Bleach, like we heard it, great album, but it wasn't like the best band in the world at the time. And that show destroyed me. I was 19 years old. It absolutely ruined music for me. It's the, it's the first time they ever played Smells Like Teen Spirit live, and they went to LA to record Nevermind the next day. Um, but I do remember how I felt when I left, and I felt horrible. I felt like I've never heard anything that good, and I never will again, and I've just wasted 19 years even trying to listen to music, and life is garbage now because of that band. It was really that powerful. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It was a good show. Yeah, they were not that good at the, as the, they weren't as good as that at the ballroom in September. It was okay. They seemed tired. Already yeah, they were already September. mad that they were famous. Yeah, it was done. Yeah, it was done. Even five months later, is not how it works. Um, well, I guess you know, I try, like I, I wanted to talk about your child. I wanted to, you know, I'm trying to music. I think is I don't know. It's kind of a hard thing to talk about. Like I was trying to figure out how to have this conversation and to to make it interesting to folks. Just like understanding the experiences of of touring and you know just of like being a drummer touring and what that was like and then moving into the world of music business and and all the things that you've done i mean it's it's i don't know it's very it's very it's it's a lot it's a lot but to me it's all connected that's and that's yeah. even writing a book which is a new thing for me and i've never been a writer but it's all it's all sort of the same place whether it's playing drums or putting out other people's records or writing things like it's the same sort of I guess it's all kind of creative but that's sort of a cop-out word for it but it's all exciting to me it's all fun and it all feels like it comes from the same part of my brain and my heart I guess what what would what, how would you describe the working in the business of music rather than the playing of music and kind of the they're very different things I and mean, I have experienced like there are people that you know like playing like there there is a disconnect between knowing how to be good at business and playing music <laughs> yeah yeah um so, you know what i mean right. so how to you know like but it, even as you said like you are already kind of chart you know like uh, as a seven-year-old like charging for the show and collecting right. money and being like yes it's a business and so how do you know what are the things that you like about both sides you know they, yeah. they are both creative but the one is very much in the music world of music and then the other is in the branding and describing of and sharing of right, music right. that you're not creating. Like, how, is there a way to kind of yeah. talk about the things you like? I've or never totally like, understood why. I mean, I, I know where the music playing of music either came from my father genetically or my uncle and mother for just supporting me in every way, buying me instruments, buying me records, taking me to shows. Like I was surrounded by music always. So there's never been a question of where that came from, but the business part of it, I got into really early too. And I'm not, I have no idea why that is. And I'll never know. But I used to recognize, you know, whatever records that had the same label when I was a kid. I didn't know what it meant, but I noticed them and I saw that logo and I knew it meant something. And like you say, selling concert tickets when I was a kid and even in high school, you know, recording a terrible demo of my punk band and then me being like, let's go to Kinko's and make artwork and dub cassettes at, at home and sell 10 copies at school tomorrow. Like that was always not only fun for me, but like as exciting as the musical part of it. Like they went hand in hand. Like it was never, I think, and so there's, there's a lot of people who play music then eventually are like, well, I'm too old to tour. I don't want to do this anymore. This is too hard. I need to get a job. So they end up in the music business, but I somehow always figured out a way to do both. And so even when, I mean, I opened a record store with my friend when, we were both 25. So that's when I was really like playing and touring in bands, but I owned a store. So I was really doing both things. And, and I mean, the only thing it's been positive and I love both, but I do wonder sometimes if I'd focused more just on playing music, if I would have been much better at that than I, I hope and think I would, if I'd spent more time and effort doing it. But that that's the one, I don't know. I don't know if it's a regret, but it's a question, a question mark. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's I don't know. There, 
just I think about these, th you know, very different things like music and business. They're you know, but they're very much intertwined. Um, well, I think you know the other thing that you know that I'd love to have you talk about that I think is a just a really fascinating part is you know as you 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 meet Roy Ayers as, as you described earlier like and and have this great conversation and it goes really well and then and it changes the way that you think about that relationship and maybe you know whether it's hope or just a different take on it you know that changes and then that starts to get you look at you know like in, you mentioned the 23 and me but I'm, I'm curious you know for you to it's a really great story to if you'd like embellish a little bit more on this this path that you took to discover the other side of your family you knew the one side of your family very right. well and then the rest is um out of reach yeah. and uh, you know become you know at times that you i think as you write like a very obsessive yeah <laughs> understanding of trying to figure this out like it's just a really other great part of the story i'd love to Thanks. You know, yeah. share with folks a little bit more. yeah i think it really comes to my mother who i'm super close with and who i still talk to all the time who's been her her father and her grandfather have lots of siblings so we have tons of cousins and so and i've always known all these people i've we have so many pictures or stories about i, I mean i knew my great grandparents till i was 10 or so i knew my great grandparents really well so i always knew there are all these people on this side of the family i knew their names i knew their photos and it was really cool and my mother's really great about staying in touch with them or even just keeping me up to date she still is and she still finds new cousins to this day which is wild so I think that's sort of the example. And then there's my father's side where I know nothing. And all I've ever known was she knew that he had three sisters named Royina, Thomasina, and Michele. And that was it. And that maybe, I think maybe she knew and that he was from LA. That's really all I ever knew about him. So a big part of me finally deciding that I wanted to meet my father, it was when I was, he was probably close to 70. I was in my mid thirties. Some of it was like kind of pragmatic, like, I'm getting older, which means he's definitely getting older. And if I want to find out even medical history or family history, just like, let alone connecting with him, just like information, it's probably time to do that if I want to. So I was really scared to do it, but I just sort of found his booking agent on the internet when he was coming to Seattle and emailed. And surprisingly, my father just called me and we'd never spoken on the phone. And we had this really easy, light conversation that was like three minutes because we just made a plan to get lunch the next week. But even that was like such a good sign because it's like, wow, this is so weird. This could be so awkward or so strange in so many ways, but it's not. And lunch was even a better version of that. It was like two hours of like really like just looking at this person across the table and like seeing the way he laughed or these certain mannerisms and just being like, it's so crazy to see myself in him. We've never really spent any time together, but we have so much in common. And uh, and the plan from there, at least in my head, and I think I said this, I was like, great, well, let's, you know, we'll do this again in a year or six months or when you're here or when I'm in New York. And that was kind of it. And then he obviously wasn't into that. And I would call him and he wouldn't answer. He'd be really short with me and kind of blew me off in person in Seattle the next year, which was really hard and kind of felt terrible. So so suddenly for the first, I spent most of my life not really caring or thinking about him. And then suddenly it was really positive. And then suddenly for the first time it was really negative. And now I was just kind of pissed and I, and I wanted to know more. And he wasn't telling me more about his family and that there are other siblings that I think he didn't want me to meet. There's it got more complicated. So I just kind of thought I need to do this without him. I wonder how I can do that. So I did 23andMe, which I think lots of people are doing and learning a lot. And, uh, and so I got that family tree. There was a picture of it. Some a, a, like third cousin reached out and just said, hey, we're cousins. I'm going to send you a family tree. And it was everything. It was crazy. Um, and it goes back to this one enslaved man, Isaac Ayers in Alabama in 1824 and has a picture and a story about everyone since him. It's really this detailed thing that was made in 1963. And it talks about the slave owner too, who's also has the same last name, Ayers. And I started looking him up and found a woman whose name is also Ayers, who had left a comment on some page where there was some information about him and her email address was there. And so I emailed and basically said, I think your ancestors might have owned mine. I'm not after anything. This is just really interesting. And you didn't do anything wrong. Do you have any information? And she got right back to me and we've become really 
good friends on email and she knows a lot. She's a genealogist. She has information and photos and all this. It's really been wild, wild thing. And then that helped connect me with more of my father's relatives. So really, I mean, I'm still not in touch with him, but I sort of went around and was able to just find tons and tons of info on people. It's been great. No, and it's, you know, I, I love that part of the story too, is being somebody who studied African-American history and, and in grad school, just like it, I mean, it, it's the whole path of from slate, you know, to, to LA, even just from Mississippi and through, and just these generations and seeing how all of that pieces together and to get, to get to reclaim that and to get to feel that part of connection of like, that's who you are. Like that just, I mean, it's a really powerful yeah. part of the book. And then, and then having conversations with, yeah, the, the, the women who you've talked to who's, you know, the genealogist, so it's a great, <laughs> It's a great character. So, like, yeah, she's amazing. Yeah, so all, many great stories. All her emails are yeah. so good. She's really good. <laughs> so, so all of these stories lead to, you know, as you said, you know, like this life in music, and and um, and then you mentioned just kind of this idea of wanting to try to start writing and telling these stories, even almost to yourself. And you know, there are multiple articles that you've had published in Rolling Stone and New York Times, and I, I can't even remember all of them. So that kind of that beginning of that, you know, what what was it that, that you know that kind of brought you into deciding that you really wanted to write and feeling there was something that you wanted to share you know it's a yeah. it's again it's another really interesting pivot to go from all of these yeah. things to like you know now i'm going to write about this and, and just tell the story of my life yeah i think i it's uh i think this also comes from my mother and her side i mean she she writes a lot of stories that she just emails me and it'll just be like observations on the subway or at the store like really quick stories and my grandmother definitely did that because i have a lot of them and they're really amazing um so i think that just maybe exists in my dna and i think at a certain point in my 40s i just thought like i have a lot of interesting stories and it'd be really fun to write them just for myself just for fun no one needs to see these i'm not going to try to publish these this is just like me trying making something exist on a hard drive and so i started writing about the record store I owned in Seattle and funny tour stories about the bands I was in. And we sold the record store in 2016. This is kind of what did it all. And I'd already written a bunch of short stories about it. And so I talked to my partner and I was like, Hey, when we kind of announced the sale, I would love to like publish sort of a combination of these stories as like a kind of whatever, thank you to Seattle. Uh, and so that happened with a stranger, which is like the cool weekly paper in Seattle, they published it. And I think that's when it was like, oh, this is like being in a band again. So I got all these emails and tweets and whatever people saying like, oh, this is this is so fun. And I met my wife at the store. And a lot of it wasn't even wasn't even about the writing. It was just about the store and the place and sort of all that kind of stuff. But whatever it was, I just got all this great feedback. And I'd stopped playing in bands a few years earlier. And in a weird way, I realized like, oh, this is a very similar feeling. You do something that you like to do present it to people somehow and then they hopefully like it or some of them do and that's I think a lot of what I liked about being in a band in addition to playing and so it just became like the new fun creative muscle and I was just writing a lot just because I really liked it and then also loved the publishing part and my wife finally astutely just said like this is fun you can keep writing about your bands and your record store but you need to write about your father and your race and I just thought like, Ugh, I know, but like, <laughs> it's so much harder and I have to think and dig, but I did that definitely with the plan of no one ever seeing it and really just started writing about each of the times I'd met my father, the time I briefly met him when I was a kid that I don't remember, all these kind of things. And, uh, and eventually had a, I'd written a lot and realized like, I know I was just doing this for myself, but I wonder if I kind of put this together, if it could become a book. And so that's what ended up happening. But I think if someone had come to me and said, hey, will you write a book? There's no way I could have done it because I would have been too scared. Right. right. Are a lot of the, are a lot of the, th is that, is that part of the process of assembling the book is that you had a lot of these, you know, chapters kind of written and then just trying to figure out just the editing process of weaving it all together yeah how to put it together i yeah. definitely yeah i mean i started i wrote about every time i could remember meeting my father which i think was five times between age like whatever five and 35 and then i started writing about okay there's, i ran out of those pretty quickly but whenever i hear his song somewhere that makes me feel different ways or when people ask me about him so i just was really like 
anything I could think about that was connected to him. I just wrote some a paragraph or 10 pages or whatever. And uh, yeah, that was like the bones of the book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, it's just, yeah, it's memoir, I think is really cool. To, you know, as you were talking, like it, it made me think, you know, that maybe, you know, one tendril through this is, you know, like talking about playing music and, and that there's a lot of things that it, it seems like that is about connection really with other people. Like you put yourself out into the world and then other people decide how they feel about it. And if they respond to that, then they'll share a story and that you create these bonds, you know, that that's a really magical thing about, I can just remember being on tour and enjoying meeting people more than playing the show. Right. I was like, yeah, the, the other bands. There's, yeah, there's, yeah. There's, you, you may remember that. Day. It was like, I don't know if I really feel like playing tonight, but like, we're going to meet all these really great people and like, right, right. God knows where we're sleeping. And right. so, but it's, it's about a community, and right? That's, what, that's about, what this is too. This is why I like doing this. It's like being in a band. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I thought that's, you know, and that's yeah. writing does that too. Just it, we find our commonalities or you, you learn something or you see yourself in something like that. That's right. where, you know, things that might be less interesting to other people. I really respond to those indie rock moments. Is there ones that I've had had with friends that are similar and just there to see it to see that live somewhere else and see yeah. that commonality is really a powerful thing. Um, you know, kind of come to the end of of the questions that I have. I wanted to allow folks to um, who might have any questions out in the audience because we're live streaming. I don't know if um, we. I don't think anybody's going to hear you on the live stream as you yell out. So, yeah, we. Oh, I'll try that. What a novel idea. So, but yeah, if anybody has any questions, um, and then yeah, I'll kind of repeat them back so people hear them. And they just go, yeah, Danny. So the the question for the the folks listening at home is is in writing the book was there did that help with the healing process of kind of coming to terms with the relationship? Yeah, it, it definitely did, but it, it also I mean it's all part of the process, but it also helped with the what's the opposite of healing the wounding process. <laughs> it was it was so hard to write some of these scenes and much harder than it was to live them because. A lot of the stuff with my father, like my uncle and my mother never presented him or any of this as very important. So like when we had run into him on the street and talked to him for two seconds, it was never like, that was your father. It was like, let's get some pizza. Like it was really, <laughs> I think in a protective way, he was just never that important. It was never negative, but it was never like super importantly positive. And, and so, so like the time when I met him at the recording studio and he just kind of was weird and blew us off at the time. It was like, Oh, whatever. That's strange. But like really and deliberately trying to relive it and trying to put myself back in that space and trying to be an eight year old kid for the first time. It was like, that was really kind of fucked up and was harder than I realized it was and all those kind of things. So, so there was a lot of that. So sort of going down here, but then yes, to answer your question, absolutely. The healing stuff. I mean, the metaphor and the metaphor kind of throughout the book is the song everybody loves the sunshine always loved that song and then right when things sort of after that seattle meeting started to go down that hill i did not like that song and now i love that song so yes the healing work yeah talk to jill so it's like finding your roots that seed that you have like skip gates and start somewhere in the middle <laughs> Question I had was you do meet your your your, your half siblings. You do meet your aunt. Um, you do this trade, like you said. That you but you don't talk in this talk. You you talk about it. and I'm I'm curious, um, uh, you know, about that experience and they, from the photographs they seem to embrace you. So. Can you tell us a little bit more? And I, I don't want you to give away the book, but right, right. I'm really intrigued, intrigued by that. Yeah. So Dr. Jolk's question, I'll try to try to rephrase that as talking a little bit more about the experience of the discovery of finding some family and, and connecting with family. Yeah. Um, I mean, you just nailed it, and I'm glad for just from a couple of pictures, but the fact that 
they seem to embrace me. That's what the whole thing has been about with meeting these people is kind of, it's almost like that's the test. And the people that I meet who do embrace me, I am just in. And there are people who I'm not even sure if we're related. Karen, the woman who's related to the slave owner, I think we're related. She hasn't done a DNA test yet, but but it doesn't matter. We're family because we treat each other like family. And there's people who, I mean, my father, sure, we're family, but are we really? I don't know. But but his sister, the woman with the glasses, Michelle A, is incredible. I feel like I've known her since I was a baby. Like there's something about the way she looks at me. Like I feel like even though she's the same age as my mother, it feels kind of grandmother-ish. But yeah, it's been incredible to connect with these people and the ones who who have been willing to connect, which is not everybody. It's really feels like we've known each other for years, even though I don't actually know that much about him. I think it's just the sort of it's the physical attributes, of course, which are fascinating. And it's also just the idea that we all agree that we're family and we want to act that way. Oh, and the question is, have you, have you met Karen? I haven't met Karen. I really want to meet Karen. We've only, she lives in Texas. We've never even spoken. We email and we Facebook message all the time. And it's, it's kind of just sort of perfect. I don't know what, I mean, I'm sure we'll talk or meet at some point, but not yet. And the question is, are you ever angry at your mother for her decisions? That is a great question. And that's one that there weren't, I mean, my editor in writing the book, I spent, the book was largely done before it got to the point of having a book deal. And then I worked on it for another year and a half with my editor. And as we were getting into it, when she's like, people are going to wonder, she's like, you don't express any anger towards your mother in this book. And she said, you don't, I'm not telling you, you have to express anger towards your mother, but you do have to explain why you don't, if you don't have any anger, because people are going to want to know. That's a great question. Um, not, but not really. I think the one time I really... I don't know if I was angry, but I really questioned her because I'd always grown up for more than grown up till I was 35, till I decided to meet my father, knowing the way she described him was like positive, charismatic, so talented, so wonderful, but very self-centered and very flaky. If you ever try to meet him, he'll never show up. That was kind of always there, this undercurrent of like fear. And I think that's probably part of why I never tried earlier. And when I finally did, I emailed and he called and we met and it was incredible. And that was the first time when I thought, like, why did she protect me so much? I could have done this 10 years ago or 20 years ago, maybe, maybe not as a kid, but at least, you know, in my 20s. Um, but then she ended up being right. So it didn't last for very long. But um, but no, I was never, I mean, growing up, I was never mad. I mean, I really had such a better childhood than people who had a lot of people who have you know a brother and a sister and a house and two parents and i think i kind of knew that even as a kid yes it feels just like so much of a, a beautiful a very american story when you know when you encounter your own understanding you might help us understand ourselves um and you uh, you spoke about the almost startling stabilizing encounter with your dad to the music in the wild. Would you speak to your own personal relationship with music while encountering your dad's music on its own, but then both of you also being involved or both of you are involved in sampling the, the business, the live band of music? Yeah, Jeremy, I'm trying to figure out how to. <laughs> I was wondering how you were going to do that. I you really hard. I really was. Um, so, uh, Translate. You, yeah, like, so describing, you know, your interactions with music, your interactions with his music that you describe, right. like in the Straight Out Compton prologue, or just um, give me a little bit more. Give me a little bit more. Encountering your dad's music. Yeah, out in the what? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and how? So how your father yeah. used 
how, how that music was brought into hip hop and then and then how you've interacted with hip hop. What's interesting is I'm I'm really not a big hip hop guy and I never have been. I you know, MTV, Kiss, Salt Lake City. I was kind of a a rock kid and and still largely am, but of course, I mean, worked in record stores and you know, I'm familiar with hip hop. Um but I've never thought about this and no one's ever asked that, but my immediate response is as far as my dad's music being sampled and all that kind of stuff. It never, I never felt protective of it or any way. Like I never thought like someone's using his music. What's up? Like it never didn't feel like mine. Whereas the original versions of some of those songs do feel like mine to me. Cause I've, everybody loves the sunshine came out four years after I was born. I've known it my whole life. That's, I mean, I think I say that in that opening scene, my music, I feel like that's, part of me in a way but i don't feel connected to it when it gets changed and when it goes away to like some other level i think it's just maybe it's because it's him singing maybe it's the album cover maybe it's something more personal and when it gets chopped up or redone it's it's different if that makes any sense Great questions, both. Yeah. So the first, yeah, like when you were in that moment of regional music as grunge was really starting to explode, like could you could you sense that something was happening? And then and then the second question is um is the proliferation of the internet um has it created this lack of regionalism in music? Did I get that? Is that a, okay? Yeah. Such a it's a great question. Yeah, the second one's really the <laughs> question. Um so yeah, the grunge thing, I mean, I think it, it was a negative thing in a way. I mean, I loved those bands. I was so excited to be, I mean, I started college at 17, to be 17 and in Seattle and seeing Soundgarden at the Moore Theater or whatever. But I also remember thinking, wow, so I've seen a bunch of these bands now. They all kind of look alike. Everyone here looks alike. Everyone's dressing alike. And I don't look like any of them. And this is a thing that I probably can't be part of. I remember I, I can buy tickets and buy records, of course, but I probably won't be in that band. And that was a real bummer. And that was kind of a thought a lot of the time. That was what I thought when I was watching MTV as a kid. That's what I thought when I was even younger. That's always kind of, I think so much of music or any anything like that is about like you being able to identify with somebody who you want to emulate. And so... That was kind of a drag. So I definitely noticed it and as an outsider. Um, the regional thing, I mean, so much. I've thought about this and talked about this so much over the years. The internet ruined a lot. I mean, it's incredible in a lot of ways. But yeah, what was so fun was that it took time for things to travel across the country or to another city or, of course, across the ocean or whatever. And like, that was exciting how slowly it moved in some ways. And you got to like feel like you knew something I mean, the, the best, the thing that I missed the most when I was telling that Smells Like Teen Spirit story was the fact that I heard that song that night and I didn't hear it again for six months. And every day I heard it in my head and I wished I could hear it. And there's, I'll never feel like that now because you can just hear it. <laughs> you know, everyone's going to be listening to this talk tomorrow, right? It's like... <laughs> no, it's funny you mentioned that. Like we, I, whenever I try to, to talk to folks about living before the internet. Like it's a weird, and I was like, the, is, you know, we talk about this in libraries is libraries have changed radically. Like you have, you used to have to, if you didn't have a book sitting on a shelf or you didn't know somebody who knew something or now KU info is gone. But like, if you couldn't call KU info, it's a like information line. How many trees are there on campus? Um, <laughs> but if you didn't know, you just didn't know. Right. And now, you know, or like you didn't have a song, you didn't have a song, you know? And so like, I, I talked with friends about this, like the like good and bad, I don't really like to use words good and bad anymore, but like the, the, the things that you gain and the things that you lose from ubiquity. Right. It's, it's a fascinating 
thing, you know, and then then maybe you do, you know, it's like, cause everything has always been shared in some way or another, but the ways in which they intersect is, is very, is radically different. You know, is it's, you're still, culture is still talking to each other and, and people emulated things from records, but yeah, I mean, it's just radically That's different. Slower pace in a good way. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah, always a good question. Yeah, you know, we actually, Nabil and I were talking about this. I was like, we, you know, like, I love the Bone Machine story. It was like, I had a similar experience with my buddy Danny here. Like, he heard Here Comes Your Man from the next record on MTV. And we were like, oh, my God, it's the next Beatles. And he went out and bought it. And then we are like, the rest of this record is horrifying and terrible. You know, we were like, this is, and, you know, and then we started listening. We were like, wait, it's not at all. And then we had to go backwards. And then the problem we had too is come on Pilgrim and Surfer Rosa were on one record. So you don't even hear Bone Machine first. You have to listen to this whole EP that's radically different than the Steve Albini record. But you know, yeah, I mean, it's like you're experiencing these different moments and then you have to start going backwards or just, I think, you know, the thing that we were talking about a little bit too is like Salt Lake City, while much bigger when we get bands and things like that, like being in Topeka, Kansas, pre-internet, you had nothing other than what you could scrounge or what you saw on TV. There was no access. And and so you would have yeah. to find these things. I mean, that and might be some of it, not, not just the sort of the speed at which things move or moved, but but the idea that like if a band came through town and three people bought seven inches that night, that was the only way anyone in that town might eventually hear that music is someone, you know, you know someone who plays it for you or who makes a mixtape. It was just like, slower but also just sort of more personal you had to try harder i like, guess or, or be luckier maybe yeah Yeah, that's sort of Yeah, I can repeat that. I mean, right. talking about the, the sort of infinite options of the internet versus a tastemaker at a radio station who gets to decide what to play. And it's as someone who runs a record company, I mean, <laughs> sounds terrible, but sometimes this frustrates us because it's like, it's so democratic. How are we supposed to do what we do the way that, you know, whereas, sure, we might be able to get someone a New York Times feature, and that's great, but that New York Times feature means less than it did 10 years ago because there are so many other ways for people to find out about music and decide what they want to listen to. So we still do what we do, but it definitely means less than it used to. Yeah. Yeah. And then Dr. Jelks, yeah, first, and then Dr. Jelks next. Oh, yeah, you right there. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you yes. I'm going to, so no, it's a great question. Like trying to give a little of the exposition to set your question up, you know, the, there two things, you know, two kind of main themes, the music theme and a family theme. And then the question is combining those two things and seeing like the, the, the musical effects within music and music ownership. Um, and 
and and how, you know, how those things interrelate. I'm not a, you said it better, but that's I was kind of for what, the what you, is, you got it from the home. What is the role of music and family formation? I got that part, yeah. which is, I mean, it's hard. I mean, I really, I only know in my family formation. I, I mean, I hope it's a huge role in every family formation because it's such a music, such a positive, incredible tool for everything. But I mean, for me, I was so lucky because I was really so close to it. Not, not I mean less so on my father's side. I just knew he was my father, but I didn't know him. I, we had those records like we had Beatles records. Like I didn't feel any closer to him, but, but my uncle really would like play saxophone for five hours a day. And I would just be there, you know, playing with my toys or, or playing drums with him or whatever. Like it was just always there. And it was such an important part of my life that I almost took for granted because it was always there. And I have tapes of me playing drums and him playing saxophone you can hear my mother introducing the songs i'm three or four years old and so for me it was just like this incredible bonding element like that's what we did that day we weren't at a movie we weren't at the circus or whatever but that that's what was happening and that's obviously it's very apparent that that's what i wanted to do as a kid and so i mean i guess maybe the answer is like it's it's sort it was sort of like a parenting thing like music was actually the thing that allowed them to do what they did. I don't really know what I'm trying to say, but it, it doesn't. It wasn't like it was something that was just there. It wasn't something we ever like had to choose to do or had to try to do because it was so achievable in our house or in our apartment or in this building where it always existed. So in that way, I feel incredibly lucky. Where I think a lot of people are like, "Let's go to a music event. Let's buy the tickets and take the kids to the thing and drive the car and do all that stuff." And this was the opposite. This was like eating or something no that's a magical part of the story to me just being somebody who's like a fan of like 70s like avant-garde new york jazz like being a kid sitting there banging on the drums like in the house with like cooper moore and like what just like that's it's it's a it's a wild new york part of the story and just the way that music is you know very you know very avant-garde you know music that was happening at that time it's it's I don't know. And, and, you know, again, just like safety and what safety means is like this, like place that should have been torn down is this like wonderful place of music and, and magical things that, you know, like that, you know, New York is, is, is very different now as I, as I, as I understand. Yeah. It, it is. It's, very different. <laughs> it's happening somewhere though. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. And Dr. Jones. Fishbone, Living Color, 24 7 Spies. They're all over there, but maybe not in the Northwest. It's in here. They all came through Salt Lake when I was in high school, and that was an incredible year. Yeah. Yeah. I saw I saw Fishbone and Living Color several times, and it was magical. Then it, it totally. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that those were moments where it was like, oh, wow, there are people doing this. Yeah. Uh, here and then we'll do we'll do this one and then this one and then we're probably at time so yes So the uh, a pair of it is a question is like how, being a biracial person in music, like how did race affect your experience in the music business? Yeah, uh, when I was in bands, when I was younger, it's always hard because there's there's two different things. There's my perception and then there's other perceptions. And I was always, I think, if I look back, I think I was always overthinking. And I was always thinking, what are people thinking about me right now? I don't belong in this room. I don't look like the dudes in Soundgarden or whatever. So when I was playing in like rock bands with all white guys, I never got, people didn't, I, I don't remember it being like, feeling like a thing, but I remember me thinking it's probably a thing. And I wonder what these people are thinking and not saying right now. Like I had a lot of that. And that went away once I, 
eventually owned a record store and started working in the record business more. And I think that's more, more just because I was older and more experienced and I could say, or people could say like, yeah, this guy owned a record store and did this. And I had sort of a credible enough resume to maybe erase any doubt, or at least that's how I saw it. So I don't, I don't think about it much now, but I definitely thought about it early on. Yeah, you get you get the last shot here. I get. I was listening to the first. The, so yeah, how how did your and you write about it well in the book? How did your white family kind of intersect with with being a person of color in a very white space? That was the second question. Yes. And the uh, first question is: Did was music a helper in navigating those those spaces for you? Right. Yeah, the, the white family thing's so interesting because it wasn't. I mean, my mother's white and my uncle's white. But those first 10 years in Amherst and New York and those places, I mean, I was really around, like, it looked like if they made like the, you know, like a TV commercial now, how it looks is what my life looked like. It was so like perfectly, di truly diverse, mixed race kids, kids of different races, mixed parents, like it was everything. And it was just, it, it was, it was so interesting that it was actually almost never talked about because it was never like. There weren't the black kids or the white kids or whatever. It was seriously just like a bunch of kids, which was great. And and even my uncle, who played jazz, played with mostly mostly black musicians in New York. So Cooper Moore and David S. Ware, all those guys are black, and I was around them a lot. So it, it wasn't a thing until definitely Salt Lake, and then um, it. I think it absolutely was an advantage for me. I think it was like I I, I think not always in a good way. I think it's like oh yeah, this guy who's part black is a pretty good drummer. Like, you know, it was like, like the equivalent of like being a good athlete or something. It, it did feel a bit like that. Like, oh yeah, I bet he can run fast. Like that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And I feel, yeah, I feel like there'd be comments like whatever, the things like that, that were compliments, but compliments like, oh, you're good at that because not, not possibly for any other reason, not because you worked hard or whatever. Yeah. Um, but, it, but to the family part, I don't think my mother knew what to do in Salt Lake. It was just me and her there. My uncle stayed in New York. That, that was much harder. Like there, I suppose she could have tried harder. I mean, I didn't know any black people or any, it was, just over once we moved there. Um, but I still spent every summer in New York and would go back like three or four times a year. So I spent like three or four months a year in New York and there was still much different and much better and maybe that helped, but Salt Lake was rough. Yeah. I want to thank everyone for, for coming, for hanging with us starting late, for it being a little late in the evening. I was just um, so excited for to be able to come here and we don't have control over Delta Airlines, <laughs> and definitely we have no control over LaGuardia Airport. Oh, maybe. Yeah. But anyway, so yeah. I really appreciate everybody going with the flow. As I was so excited for him to be able to come here and people hear his story, and 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 really, I can't uh, tell you how much you know how much more is in this book. It's just a a lovely memoir with so many great stories. So I, I hope people check it out and uh, and get a copy or. We have a copy here you can, at the library. You can check that out too. Uh, you just returned it. Oh, hey, I read <laughs> the copy I read too. So, but yeah, um, and so thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, it's really great to see everyone. And Raven has copies of the book for sale, and um, we'll be back there uh, at that other table to sign copies. Hang out and sign books. And thank you, Brad. This has been a great conversation. And thank you, everybody, for coming. It's been really great. Yeah, thanks so much. Have a good night.